Good morning. Today is uh, November 3rd, and it's our first week in November. October is expired. And our text is Ezekiel 18. Our title is Righteous Father. And I just remind you, the election is Tuesday. Be sure to vote and be sure to pray. Now let's look at our text. Chapter 18, all 35 verses, 32 verses. The word of the Lord came to me. What do you mean by repeating this proverb concerning the land of Israel? The fathers have eaten the sour grapes and the children's teeth are set on edge. As I live, declared the Lord, this proverb shall no longer be used by you in Israel. Behold, all souls are mine. The souls of the father as well as the souls of the son is mine and the soul of him who sins will surely die. If a man does what's righteous and he does what's right and just, he does not eat on the mountains or lift his eyes to the idols of Israel, does not defile his neighbor's wife, does not oppress anyone, but restores to the Deborah its pledge, commits no robbery, gives bread to the hungry, covers the naked with a garment, does not lend it interest or take profit, withholds his hands from injustice, executes true justice between man and man, walks in his statues, and keeps my rule faithfully he is righteous he shall live declares the lord if he fathers a son who is violent a shedder of blood who does any of these things though he himself did none of these things he even eats upon the mountains and defiles his neighbor's wife oppresses the poor and needy commits a robbery does not restore the pledge and lifts up his eyes to the idols and commits abomination lends it interest and takes profit shall he live he shall not live because he has done all these abominations he shall surely die but his blood will be upon himself now suppose this father this man fathers a son who sees all the sins of his father has done he sees and does not do likewise he does not eat upon the mountains or lift up his eyes to the idols and the house of Israel does not defile his neighbor's wife, does not oppress anyone, exacts no pledge, commits no robbery, but gives bread to the hungry and covers the naked with a garment, withholds his hand from iniquity or takes no interest or profit, obeys the rules and walks in my statue. He shall not die for his father's iniquity. He shall live. As for his father, because he practiced extortion, robbed his brother, and did what is not good upon the people, he shall die for his iniquity. Yet you said, Why should not the son suffer for the iniquity of the father? When the son has done what is just and right and has been careful to observe my statutes, he shall surely live. The soul who sins shall die. The son shall not suffer from the iniquity of the father, nor the father suffer for the iniquity of the son. The righteousness of the righteous shall be upon himself, and the wickedness of the wicked shall be upon himself. But if a wicked person turns away from the sin that he's committed and keeps all my statutes and does what is just and right, he shall live and not, he shall not die. None of the transgressions he has committed shall be remembered against him. For the righteous that he has done, he shall live. Have I pleasure in the death of the wicked, declares the Lord, and not rather that he turn from his way and live? When a righteous man turns away from his righteousness and does injustice and does the same abomination as the wicked does, shall he live? None of the righteous deeds he has done will be remembered for the treachery of which he is guilty and sin that he has committed, for them he shall die. When you say, The way of the Lord is not just, hear now, O house of Israel. Is my way not just? Is it not your ways that are not just? When a righteous man turns from his righteousness and does injustice, he shall die for it. For the injustice he's done, he shall die. Again, when a wicked man turns from wickedness he has committed and does what is just and right, he shall save a life. Because he is considered and turns away from all the transgressions he's committed, he shall live, he shall not die. 
Yet the house of Israel says, the way of the Lord is not just. The house of Israel, all my ways are just. Is it not your ways that are just? Therefore, I will judge you, O house of Israel, every one according to his ways. Repent and turn from all your transgression. Lest your iniquity be ruined, cast yourself from transgressions that you've committed. Make for yourself a new heart and a new spirit. Why will you die, O house of Israel? I have no pleasure in the death of anyone, declares the Lord. So turn and live. Well, a common word in this chapter is the word righteousness, and I think it's been in there eight times. The key phrase is, all souls are mine. Now, we are going to have an election in two days, and uh, it's interesting that the election issues are immigration, economy, and abortion. But the bigger issue for the election is righteousness. Proverbs 14, 34, righteousness exalts a nation, but sin is a reproach to any people. The greatest election that affects the greatest issue that affects the future of this nation is righteousness. In the book of Hebrews, it says of the sun, he says, thy throne, O God, is forever and ever. The scepter of uprightness is a scepter of your kingdom. Today we're going to learn much about God, much about salvation, and much about sin in this rich scripture. The first thing we learn is a righteous standard. The way of the Lord is just. The Proverbs that are, have been given in this text, I've heard this proverb for years, you know, the father of eaten sour grapes, the children's teeth are set on edge. I never knew what it meant. The Lord asks the people, why is it you're always saying this proverb? And then he says, as I live, I don't want you to ever use this proverb again. What was the meaning of the proverb? That God so despised it. And the meaning was this, that they blamed their fathers for their problems and their sin. Now, if we look at Exodus 20 and verse 5, the scripture says, For the Lord your God is a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the children upon the third and fourth generation. And what that is saying is that we do pass on sins. We teach our children how to sin, and we influence them. But while we pass on sins, when it comes right down to it, before God, and before the law, prior to this century, we were responsible for the sins that we commit. Blaming parents for all of our sins is part of a fallen generation. Yes, it may be true they did all these horrible things. It may or may not be true because children have kind of a sometimes not a real accurate picture of it. But the fact, and they don't know all the facts, but the fact is, is that making them into victims creates a situation where they're not responsibility for their actions. One of the big cases that's resurfacing right now is the Menendez brothers in California. You know, Lyle and uh, I forget what his brother's name is. They went in and murdered their parents. And it's come out. And somehow it was suppressed in the trial, but it's come out. They've been in jail 30 years. It's come out that the father abused them greatly. In fact, in ways I wouldn't even want to say. And now people are saying they should be released. And there's uh, certain lawyers that think that they'll be out in a very short time. I have some sympathy for them. Because if what is true, if what they say is true, is true, I have some sympathy. But you know, they had other options. They could have just left and abandoned their father. No, they killed him. One of my concerns is in this generation where we blame everything on our parents and we do not take responsibility ourselves is we're creating a generation of people 
who is not prepared to meet God. Three theological statements are in this passage of Scripture. First, he says, all souls are mine. God is the creator and possessor of every soul, and he is the standard for judgment. Then he says, the soul of the Father as well as the soul of the Son. God is saying, I have no favoritism to any generation. Now we think of roles, role playing. The Father has a role, the Son has a role. The Father's role is to guide and discipline the Son. The Son's role is to submit and obey. There are many roles, the employer and the employee role, husbands and wives. The Bible tells the wives to submit to the husbands. But let me tell you this, there's much teaching on all this in the Bible, and we've kind of thrown a lot of that out and created many societal problems because people don't know who they are and what they're supposed to be. But let me tell you something. If we go back to the traditional roles of the scripture, you still come down to this, that each man shall bear his own burden. You are still responsible for what you have done. You can't blame God. You can't blame your parents. You can't blame your husband. You can't blame your wife. You can't blame your brother, your sister, your teachers, your school, anything. What have you done? And then God gives this verse, it says, the soul that sins will die. Well, all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. What does that mean? It means our fate is sealed. We face a Christless eternity, but God, because of his great love, sent his son, Jesus Christ, to be a blood sacrifice for our sins, pay the penalty, and give us amnesty, pardon, and adoption. So the second thing we see is righteous responsibility. Now, God lists a, 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 a list of standards of things he expects from people. This is not the Ten Commandments. It's just kind of a list. Idolatry is the first one, and that involves the first three commandments. Marriage, how a man treats his wife, is very, very important, has much to do with his actual righteousness. Third is how you conduct business and your honesty and integrity. Fourth is your generosity to those who are hurting. And then your justice. Are you just with all the people you deal with? Do you give them, treat them all the same? And then last is the concept of walking in God's statues, which begins in the Ten Commandments. So then he gives many examples, and this is a lot of scripture because it seems like you could say it in a shorter way, but they chose not to, of personal responsibility. They ask the question, so the son bear the iniquity of the father? Shall the father bear the iniquity of the son? We go back to those three uh, theological statements that we read last uh, or yes in the first point the three theological statements were that uh, all souls are mine the soul of the father as well as the soul of the son is mine the soul who sins shall die what does this mean the soul that sins shall die it means everybody faces eternal destiny it says, the righteous of righteousness shall be upon himself. You'll be judged by your own righteousness, not somebody else's. And you'll be judged by your own wickedness, not the influence somebody else had on you. That is a righteous, righteous judgment. Then we come to righteous identity. What we do is who we are. The heart of God. God says he has no pleasure in the death of the wicked. His heart's desire, the scripture says, was that all would repent. Someone might say, how would a loving God send someone to hell? Well, God really doesn't want to send anyone to hell. In fact, the scripture says he was not willing that any should perish in 1 Peter 3, 9, but all come to the knowledge of the truth. 
In John 3, 16, God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. What God did was he paid the ultimate price, and he did everything possible that you could have eternal life and spend eternity in heaven. So we have called this the righteous identity. So when we think of righteous identity, there are two examples. The first man uh, had a midlife uh, conversion. He was a horrible man. His first 40 years of life were horrible. I knew a guy like that. He was a very rich man and he spent his life cheating everybody and did all kinds of terrible things and he got saved. And you know, the scripture says he'll be remembered for his good work. Well, God will remember his good work and God will remember he loved Jesus and he will live. Now, there were some people in the community that still remembered his prior days. The second example is a man, and I know a man like this, whose early life was one of righteousness, and then he turned away. Very few people remember those early years. Most people know him for his second years and for his evil works. God says he will die. So someone says, well, wait a minute. I thought we had eternal security. Well, the old covenant is based on actions. The new covenant is based on Christ and our relationship with him. John 10, 29 says, no man can snatch us from the father's hand. And Hebrews 12, 6 says, for the Lord disciplines the one he loves and chastises everyone he receives. Now, I'll tell you what, if you see a fellow that walked with God and all of a sudden he's went off the deep end, if he's a child of God, God is going to catch him and bring him back. But if he stays that way all of his life, you know, the Bible says, whom the Lord loves, he disciplines. No one can take him out of the Father's hand. If he spends the rest of his life living like the devil without repentance, one has to ask, did he ever really believe? Because you see, there is no evidence of the Father bringing him back. The fourth thing we see is a righteous judge. The all-seeing God knows your heart. The scripture says, the way of the Lord is not just. God heard this from his people. You know, that's an interesting thing. When you get mad and blame God, he hears that. He knows that. O house of Israel, are my ways not just? It's your ways that are not just. In today's world is different than ancient Israel. They blamed God and felt that God had forsaken them. But in today's world, we live in a world that didn't feel like God forsook them. They have marginalized and diminished God. They have sophisticated gods of science and mental things. They are above the old ways and the just God. In fact, there are many of our leading elites today who have the sense that those who believe in God in the old way are a danger to our society. And let's talk about the justice of man. Abortion, one of the big issues right now, the right to choose. What about the rights of a helpless child? Does a helpless child have rights? We have a simple choice. We can choose God who is eternal, inerrant, and choose his reliable word. We can choose to believe God is a person with feelings like we are. We can choose to believe he's a sovereign Lord of the universe. Ezekiel 18.30 says, Therefore I will judge you, O house of Israel. Everyone according to his ways declares the Lord. 
The last thing we see in this text is a righteous call. You know, in the Old Testament, there's a call to righteousness. In the New Testament, we are called to the King of Righteousness, Jesus, who comes and lives in our heart and places that righteous spirit in there and then starts working from the inside out, changing us little by little until that day when we are changed in a, in a twinkling of an eye. The scripture says, I will judge you, O house of Israel, everyone according to his ways. Some may say, well, that's Old Testament. No, that's New Testament. In the New Testament, we read in Revelation 20, 11 through 12, that God set up a great white throne and him who was seated on it and from his presence, earth and the sky fled away. No place was found for them. And then he said, I saw the dead, the great and the small, standing before the throne, and the books were open. Then another book was opened, the book of life. And the dead were judged by what was written in the books according to what they had done. And the sea gave up the dead, and death and Hades gave up the dead, but they were judged, each one of them, according to what they had done. Then death and Hades were thrown in the lake of fire. The second death is the lake of fire. If anyone's name was not written in the book of life, he was thrown in the lake of fire. Well, here's the deal. Is every man was judged according to his deeds in the Old Testament, but in the New Testament, every man was also judged according to his deeds. We often forget that. And one of the interesting things is, is there was another book, and that was the book of life. These are the people who have come to that place in life where they've said, Lord, I'm a sinner. I can't save myself. I need the Savior. I need the Messiah. Forgive my sins, Lord. Come into my heart and be my Savior. And when they did that, the Lord wrote their name in the Lamb's book of life because they were covered with the blood of Christ and they escaped the judgment. Then he tells these people, repent and turn from all your transgressions, lest your iniquity be your ruin. Then he says, cast away all your transgressions. Receive a new heart and a new spirit. That new heart and a new spirit was happened when we're born again. He said, so turn and live. God says it clearly. He has no pleasure in the death of any person. He says that I judge people by their own sins, not the sins of their father, their mother, their brother, their sister, or anyone else. And I'm calling them to Christ to find forgiveness and have their sins covered by the blood so they can live with me forever. What a wonderful opportunity. Shall we pray? I pray, Lord, if there's anyone here watching today that has not come to this place where they have said, Lord, I am a sinner. Forgive my sins. Come into my life and be my savior that if they haven't done that, that they would do it just now and meet the Lord of hosts in a great and a mighty way. In Jesus' name, amen.